Hello, I'm Robert Becker and I'm putting this video together for the Gathering for Gardener presentation that's coming up in Atlanta, Georgia in February 2024. It's called Soap Film Structures on Platonic Solid Frames. So our first slide here just reviews the five different platonic solids, tetrahedron, octahedron, cube, dodecahedron, icosahedron, which you may or may not be familiar with. The solids are on the top and frames are on the bottom, hollow frames. Um, and we'll be using each of those, some a lot more than others, as we'll see. The frames are made very inexpensively and very quickly, easily, using just coffee stir straws and twist ties. And there's a whole separate video on my g for g 15 link um, that takes you to the construction of the, of the coffee stirs. Um, so the question is, if we take a tetrahedral frame and dip it in soapy water, what will the configuration of soap films look like? Hmm. Maybe you've seen this before. If not, you're in for a treat. That's it. That beautiful arrangement there. That's actually got six flat films coming from each of the six edges of the Tetra region, all meeting at a central point. Um, and that's, that's just crazy cool um, and was actually observed 150 years ago by Joseph Plateau, the Belgian mathematician. Um, he figured out that those were minimal surface structures, that is, the least amount of material required to cover that frame. And uh, he did so even though he was completely blind. So apparently he had assistants who would uh, dip these frames in to soapy water and describe them to him, and he could visualize in his mind's eye that these were all minimal surface structures. He came up with several laws called Plateau's Laws regarding them. Those laws were later proven by American mathematician Gene Taylor some hundred years later, so 50 years ago, um, to be mathematically sound. Uh, the cool thing is what causes them to be, what causes soap films to achieve minimal surface area always and very quickly is a molecular explanation. By the way, I was a high school chemistry teacher for 36 years, absolutely loved it, and I would show students these soap film demonstrations to illustrate the attraction between water molecules. So there's a soap film. It's like a sandwich with a soap molecule on top and bottom layers of that. That's the bread. And then the meat of the sandwich is uh, the water molecules, not three molecules thick, more like three billion, but still extremely thin. And the fact that there are strong attractions right there between the water molecules, that's known as hydrogen bonding. It's the strongest intermolecular force there is. And water has it extensively. And because they're attracted to each other, because water is very sticky to its own kind, it makes this soap film always be as small as possible. So the fact that soap films get to be minimal surface area is a good illustration of hydrogen bonding. But again, here was one of Plateau's laws. One, two, three. Now, three films would meet along an edge called a plateau border, like those three first ones met along this border, um, all at 120 degree angles. And then four such borders could meet at a single point. Um, I don't know if you call that a plateau point. It was a vertex of sorts. Um, and those would be at the special 109.5 degree angle. So. Those were some of the laws that govern them. That's true regardless of the shape, not just the tetrahedron, but all the other shapes we show you will follow those laws. Three films meeting at a border, and then four borders meeting at a vertex. No more, okay? And the cool thing is, this was a solution not just to minimal surface area, it's also one that the carbon atom utilizes, and that is when carbon bonds, it bonds to four things, and those bonds are spread apart as far away from each other as possible, because those bonds are electrons that are negatively charged, and they repel each other. So it's kind of neat that there's this other layer of chemistry that talks about molecular uh, shapes and uh, the geometries of those, and here's, carb here's carbon's geometry, tetrahedral, with that 109.5 degree angle. That's going to come up time and time again. There's a molecule of methane, CH4. 
The cool thing is if you then pop one of those six films, it gives you a new um, arrangement there. And that arrangement is just made up of three films. They rearrange themselves now. There's one, two, three. The first two are kind of saddle shaped, uh, hyperbolic of sorts. And that last one there, the piece of a circle, maybe a circle, um, is flat. And again, those three films are meeting in 120 degrees all along this boundary here. So that's kind of neat. And if we then continue and pop that last one, now we get just one film. And that's a beautiful structure there. Uh, definite saddle structure, uh, no flatness to it. In fact, that's a curvature that's referred to as negative curvature. Um, and Plateau point out that it's exactly the same curvature across the whole surface. Um, and there it is, that one film. It approximates a hyperbolic paraboloid, and I've seen sites that say that it is that, but other sites that argue no, it's not, because a hyperbolic paraboloid is not a minimal surface. Um, but instead, it probably is a section of a helicoid, and I've kind of indicated that here, that that's the correct fit because that is a minimal surface structure. So, uh, there's some of the math involved. One cool, completely um, uh, tangential thing is I took this shape, or technically I took a hyperbolic paraboloid of this arrangement, that is from the tetrahedron, and created a plastic construction toy called Hypertiles that has now become kind of my retirement hobby. And that's the other talk I gave for uh, G4G15 was on that. Uh, I have a video link to that. And when you start putting those together, you get some rather amazing structures, the little connectors there and all kinds of cool things you can do with that. The other thing you can do is kind of dip it once and a half dip it once and then it halfway again to trap a bubble. And that is also following all of Plateau's laws, that beautiful shape there. Um, it looks like a little tetrahedron, but of course it's not, it's bulging out on all the sides. Um, and that's because again, the tetrahedral angles, according to Plateau's laws, those are all meeting 109.5, but of course, a tetrahedron has edges that meet at 60 degrees, and that's a big spread there. So it forces this trapped bubble of air to, uh, to be rather bulgy in the middle. So it's kind of a compromise, not just how to cover that frame with the least amount of surface area, how to cover that frame and encapsulate whatever, 50 milliliters of air, um, a certain volume of air, at the same time, and that is the best way of doing that. Okay, so is it a sphere? No. Is it a tetrahedron? No. I would argue that shape there is some kind of a hybrid shape, which I'm going to call, that's right, a sphetrahedron. Um, are those actually spheres that follow the surfaces there? I imagine they might be sphere sections that are distorted, but um, hard to say. Okay, I don't have the math background for that, but it's also kind of cool to realize that each one of those is the same kind of tetrahedral arrangement in carbon, and it kind of is analogous then to the molecule tetrahedrane, C4H4. That's actually never been synthesized, probably because those bonds are so strained, trying to be 60 instead of 109.5. Um, but it is a hypothetically possible molecule, according to physical chemists, and there are derivatives of it. For instance, if you put a T-butyl group on each of those places instead of the hydrins and get tetra tertiary butyl tetrahedrane, you get, which is C20H36, that is a molecule that's been synthesized. So that arrangement of carbon ends is possible. Um, so kind of fun there. And one other cool thing that happens, if you pop that, boom, look what just happened. We got a little tiny one and we pop that, we get even a tinier one. 
I try to pop that, but my fingers are just too big. So here that one is again in slow motion, kind of. And that shows you that that bubble formed up top and then dropped into position. I then show the other one in slow motion, but this one is just, I, I don't have really good camera equipment to do this, so you really don't see that this is maybe doing the same thing, or maybe that bubble never lost, lost contact with the center point. Hard to tell, and it's also bouncing around quite a bit there. So, when you pop a, a uh, one of these um, spectrohedrons, another one forms right away, and you can also use a straw to put your own ones instead of double dipping. And here's kind of a fun one I like to do around winter time for the students. That's right, a little sphetrohedron snowman. Here's that same thing except, um, well, face it, without gravity. <laughs> well, gravity's there, but it doesn't have much impact on that. We have more than one direction we can take this uh, spectrohedron snowman. Why not just uh, keep building them in all directions? I speed up there a bit. I'm not that fast, but there it is, a four-way snowman made out of little uh, joined together spectrohedrons. Um, and that middle one there probably is no longer a spectrohedron, but it's probably got properties of a truncated tetrahedron. We'll come back to that. Here is a container with the lid. I drilled a hole, connected a tube, filled it with water, drop in a piece of dry ice. Anytime I could use dry ice in my chemistry classrooms, I would do so. And I've got here a little hose to pump CO2 gas, cloudy CO2 gas, into these trapped gas spaces. So there it is. And what do you notice right here? Hopefully you see that that thing was shrinking. That soap bubble was shrinking. Carbon dioxide is very soluble in water. That's what soda is all about. And so that carbon dioxide is dissolving very quickly into the soap film, the water of the soap film, and then effervescing, outgassing out the other side, so that a carbon dioxide filled bubble shrinks pretty quickly. Okay, we'll see that again. There we go. It also, that's sitting a lot lower because of the density of carbon dioxide. If I pop it, there we go, there's a little one, and see how it's shrinking. Okay, and all the extra gas just kind of rushed out of the bottom. Now I'm going to do that same thing, I'm going to pop it on top. Hmm, what are your predictions on this one? Oh, that was neat. That dense bubble sank to the bottom and I've got a little puddle of carbon dioxide mist sitting there on the top. So, fun with carbon dioxide, with dry ice and these uh, spectrohedrons. Now, this is a demonstration that's a, a kind of a loop string tied off of a, on a, just a wire frame. And I'm going to dip that in the soapy water. Dry off my thumb to pop the film inside there to create a hole inside a soap film. That would be a nice perfect circle except for gravity, but if I hold it hold the whole thing horizontal, it does make a circle that kind of wanders around because any one of those arrangements there has the same surface area. So there's nothing holding that circle in the center, for example. So that's kind of a fun demonstration. And by the way, a lot of these demonstrations were developed over 130 years ago and written up in a book um, by C.V. Boys. So that's one worth pursuing. And so here's that same thing applied to a tetrahedron. There's a little tetrahedron made out of coffee stirs and twist ties, which I'm going to put in the center here, um, except, whoop, let's try that again. Yeah, way too heavy. So instead, I've made one here out of broom bristles. Let's see if we can get a better look at that. And some glue uh, that's much, much, much lighter, okay? So this is a little tetrahedral frame 
that is light enough to be suspended uh, by the other soap films. So watch what happens when I put this in there now. There it goes. And that's kind of cool right there that it stays there. I can pop the surface in the middle there. I have to pop all the different sides of it there and my fingers wet so that's giving me some trouble there. And I get that, which is a tetrahedral hole in a tetrahedral frame. And you notice that I was pulling off to the side. This one is more stable if that's in the middle because that would be a minimal surface area. Uh, so it's being held in the position in the middle. Okay, keep that in mind. It's essentially fixed to one point. Now, I pop that frame and now we get that three film version and now it can it's not limited to a point but it can travel along that uh, border there that curved border and uh, with no problem at all oh, and there you see the last one pop and I've got just now a simple film across the bottom and now it's like the circle was in the circular film except this is a triangular hole um, but able still to support the whole tetrahedron traveling along frictionlessly, as it were, on this uh, flat soap film there. Okay? So that's kind of fun. Cube. Okay, so try to envision now what you think it would look like to have a cubed dipped in soapy water. How many different members are there? There's 12 edges. Well, we have 12, 12 films all meeting at a central point. Let's see what we get. Ah, right there. We do not. Instead, we get a square, kind of a square. It's got kind of rounded sides to it there. And again, we can't have 12 films all meet at the same point. We can't have what would be essentially eight different uh, plateau borders meet at a single point. So instead, they're still following plateau's laws and meeting four to four to a frame and look I'm blowing in the different sides and causing that square to change its orientation so there will be three different orientations all minimal surface that you can kind of uh, switch between with a little bound little border in between a little higher um, surface area border but um, that's kind of fun I'm just blowing on the different surfaces and uh, let's see, there's what I th think of as a graph for it. So total surface area with three equivalent minimums. And again, the, the chemistry connection, those are each tetrahedral. And if you were to take and make a little molecule of four carbons, and yes, there is some bond strain there because they're 90 degrees instead of 109.5, but that's the molecule cyclobutane, C4H8, which does exist. Watch what happens if I pop that. Okay, so that's a cool structure and that's a lot less surface area than the previous one. So we're gonna go back and kind of switch our whole thing about it. When you dip a frame in soapy water, what shows up is the best way to cover that with the least amount of material and no holes. Now with a tetrahedron, I really couldn't poke a hole in it they wouldn't break one of the films to one of the edges. But right here, I did. I poked a hole in this, that center square, and that, because that film was not touching any of the edges, it now went to a whole separate solution. This film right here is covering all 12 um, edges of the cube with a lot less surface area than when it had to be connected with no hole. It's kind of like the difference between a sphere and a torus with a torus in the whole middle it's got all different kinds of topological properties so that's kind of neat to think about that film right there is a better better solution oh, if I try popping different parts of it let's see let's put opposite films there and see what we can do oh that just popped away right to a different thing that's not covering all the surfaces but I'm going to try that again and sometimes it's just the uh, luck of the draw and I'm gonna pop a couple different things here and get that surface, 
which is kind of cool. That's a single film, kind of like the tetrahedron got down to that. It's a saddle structure. And again, my guess is it's not hyperbolic, uh, not a hyperbolic paraboloid. Instead, it's based on a, a helicoid, um, section of a helicoid. So that's neat. Um, here is another uh, series of films I can pop that's kind of fun. It again will give me a saddle structure, but it's a three-way saddle structure. And look what happens when I distort the cube. Um, that saddle structure flexes very nicely. So that's one of the benefits of using these coffee stirs and twist ties. You can then manipulate the frames. Couldn't do that with a tetrahedron because it's made of triangles and doesn't have this kind of flexibility. That shape um, is actually referred to as a monkey saddle. It's kind of a three-way hyperbolic surface. Um, I guess it's a helicoidal version of that. Um, and it's called a monkey saddle because I guess a monkey could sit on it. It's not going to be mounted on the monkey. The monkey mount, the monkey's the rider. And his two legs and tail will all be comfortably able to hang out like that and not, uh, <laughs> not get in the way. So there's a monkey saddle. And that'll come up again on another surface. Okay. Now, you could double dip this, but you're kind of then locked into a certain bubble in the center. I'm going to show you what happens if you just, uh, here we go, create that bubble with a straw. Now that was interesting. Did you catch that that started off as a sphetrahedron, but as soon as it got, got big enough to touch the other, um, the other plateau borders, it became this shape. Okay, so looking at that shape, there is a cube, but it's not actually a cube. It's kind of bulging, kind of like the sphetrahedron. And again, those angles are meeting at, comparing to a cube, 109.5 instead of the 90. Okay, so again, that's pushed them outwards. Not nearly as pronounced as the sphetrahedron was, but this means that we have a sphere and a cube hybridizing to make, of course, a sphube. And that sphube, much more uh, closely approximating a cube than a sphetrahedron did a tetrahedron, but still distorted by, that, uh, by, by Plato's laws, saying that those have to be 109.5 degree angles. Okay? And is there a molecule that's analogous to this that has eight carbons? Yes, there is. The molecule is called cubane, C8H8. That has been synthesized. Not easily, but it does exist. And here's kind of fun. I'm going to make it, and then I'm going to draw that out to see how small my little sphube can be. And it can get so small that it does seem to disobey Plato's laws. That looks like I have eight borders all coming to a single point, but of course it's not. They're coming to a little tiny sphube. Um, but as you can see, that is not, that's kind of caught on what's not the minimal surface. I'm going to blow um, on one side here and you'll see right there, it got me the square and that bubble moved over, became a little tiny sphetrahedron and that locked in. So that's a little better surface area wise than the previous thing was. Okay. So um, lots of fun you can have with a sphube. As I said before, the cube can be dis distorted. Let's see what that does to a suspended sphube. If we distort it, it doesn't really seem to have much impact at all on the shape of the sphube. And unless I get it to the point where the dimensions of the distorted cube frame get smaller than the sphube on the inside, as it does right there, and then it starts to distort it. So, um, for the most part, you can distort the cube frame without having too much impact on the uh, sphube suspended in the middle, unless you go too far with it. And, got to add some dry ice to this. Kind of a fun little puddle of dry seeing on the top there. So, right away, you're noticing this. Carbon dioxide is very dense, and look at how it's distorting my sphube. 
making it much wider at the base and the whole thing well below the center. But there it is, a few blown with uh, CO2. And, uh, whoop, here we go. And watch what happens when I, I get rid of a couple of the side things here. We see those the mist drop. Now I'm going to pop that top film there. And this is kind of fun. There it is, like a little lake of CO2 gas hanging out in there. Oh, and then it pops. And, uh, yeah. So, that, oh, and right there, when one film popped, we happened to get this. I want to show this. This is actually a trigonal prism, okay? Or I guess because it's a cross between that and a sphere, maybe it's a trigonal schism, uh, that can also form there. Um, that would, just happens to ha form momentarily right here in the middle of this video. And that's kind of fun. Whoop. Now I'm going to take a few already in existence and fill it with some CO2. And this is kind of fun because it's definitely filling from the bottom up. But my, you'll notice this. This fube is not nearly as sunken or distorted. It's getting a little distorted there. And that's because what we've got in there is not pure CO2, but a mixture of air and CO2. Therefore, it's not nearly as dense um, as it was when it was pure CO2. So, that's kind of fun. Next, the octahedron. And so my octahedron, wow, that's got some real problems because it has four edges coming together um, to form a, a vertex on the octahedron, but four films cannot all come together at once. So this has all kinds of different possibilities if it's going to follow Plateau's law. As I pull it out, again, it doesn't give me what I think is the minimum minimum surface, and I'm having to kind of blow on the sides here to lock it in. There it is. Oop, and I'll show you that to you. That's gorgeous arrangement there. Kind of like a bunch of kite films all mean at the center. And some isosceles triangle films coming out to join them. That is, I believe, the minimum way of connecting all of the members of an octahedron with the least amount of material and no holes. Worth pointing out. Okay, we'll see that again. Um, and there's that, see that little hexagonal film that formed at first? It doesn't always give us the, oh, there it goes. It locks in there and Again, that's a tetrahedral arrangement in the middle. Here's a close-up of it. Um, and kind of worth pursuing. Those are our six films that all meet at one solid point. So this is following all the rules, all the Plateau's laws, but it just gives you this amazing configuration. And yes, those are each little tetrahedra. And that analogous structure is a very common compound called neopentane or 2,2-dimethylpropane. That's a component in, in gasoline, for example, petroleum. So, some cool organic chemistry in this one. Popping various surfaces on this, and that, by the way, didn't start with that tetrahedron in the middle. It started with a square frame in the middle, so there's all these local mins that happen. Ooh, that's kind of neat, with some saddle structures meeting, but there's a body diagonal in there. Yeah, all kinds of fun stuff there. Pop one more and get just a single saddle structure film there. Uh, you could do this on and on. There I'm starting with a tetrahedral frame, a uh, tetrahedral in the middle. Um, pop a couple of them here and uh, that's actually different than what I had before kind of neat, or at least it's a different perspective. It's hard to chart these. Here's another one. I'm trying to pop that little frame there and get this, which is just a really cool. That is actually collect connecting all of the members with a lot less material. It has two holes in it, though. Uh, so, like a double torus. And yet another one, 
we're going to pop some of those kite, oh, some of the triangular ones there. Now this is not touching all of the members, but it's touching a good number of them, I think. Yeah, all but the four all around the equator. And that's a cool thing. It's got the film in the middle, which I can pop and get two completely separate saddle structures. That's kind of fun. And if we, again, there's so many possibilities here. This one in particular gets you something that is really unusual. That square is distorted in the square it goes across the center in cool ways by these I'll call them bat kite configurations coming from the other ends there there's just so much going on there so many possibilities to just play with the uh, different arrangements around uh, an octahedral frame what about trapping a bubble in there so Oh, no, this is where I popped the center one. Sorry. Yes. And that goes out to the edges and very quickly just forms the triangles. So that is covering all of the members there, but it's got just nothing but flat surfaces. So that appears to be a minimal surface there. And here's where I introduce a bubble in the middle. And it starts off right there forming a little tetrahedron, sorry, a svetrahedron in the middle. But as it gets bigger, it now forms a prism, then some other thing, and we finally get to that arrangement, which is close to an octahedron, again, curved, so maybe a sphoctahedron, but um, it's actually a truncated tetrahedron, or a truncated svetrahedron, whatever. And maybe you can see that with alternating triangular faces and hexagonal faces, okay? And again, every one of these obeying Plato's laws. I'm going to draw some of that out, and it gets me back to my tetrahedron in the middle. Um, and there it is just left with that there, which is kind of fun. All kinds of possibilities with uh, suspending bubbles in here because there's so many possible ways it can connect. So there's one that was double dipped. And if you notice, this one has faces that are not triangles or hexagons. This one is a four sided, a quadrilateral. And um, as I jiggled around, now it became pentagonal. As I draw some air out, again, that's not an octahedron. It's not a truncated tetrahedron. It's kind of something in between as though, so there's a truncated tetrahedron on the left, and you can see I changed it to one that has pentagonal and quadrilateral edges to it. So here we are adding some CO2 to a Svoctahedron to see what we get. It's a little difficult. The density of it seems to make it want to migrate toward one of the vertices there, but that appears to be a truncated tetrahedron and shows up really nicely. Okay, but it's shrinking. As it shrinks, it's obviously going to lose some of those hexagonal faces. This is my tetrahedral frame. It first got caught up on one of the side tetrahedrons and then I had to jiggle it to get to the middle and now I'm popping some of its surfaces to get me, that's right, a tetrahedral hole in the middle of an octahedral soap film and that's kind of fun. Whoops! And then it gets distorted um, and where it ends up is always going to be, well, that's kind of fun, um, the solution to how best to cover that remaining uh, those remaining members with the least amount of, of surface area. <laughs> okay, and this brings us to the dodecahedron. What's that going to look like when I dip it in there? Well, generally speaking, it gives you films that are not quite recognizable as anything. They don't meet in the middle. They meet off to the side. They tend to just form a bunch of pentagonal flat surfaces 
on the sides of it, but if you double dip it, as I just did there, and cap, uh, kind of capture a bubble, you can get this. That is a dodecahedral bubble trapped inside a dodecahedral frame, and here I'm drawing some of the air out to make it even smaller. Is it actually a dodecahedron? Not quite. I would argue those edges are a little bit curved, and the reason for that is because the films want to meet at 109.5, and a, a pentagon has a, an angle of 108, so it's a little distorted, and right here, you see the reflection of this stick, and you see it's rather skinny, implying this is slightly, what, convex, pointing outward and giving us a little bit of a smaller image. If it were completely flat, and they do appear flat, but if it were flat, this wouldn't be that small of a, uh, of a reflection. So, I'm going to go ahead, I'm not going to call it a a sphodecahedron, we'll just call it a dodecahedron, but it's, I think it's a little bit bulgy. So this is a really fun one here. Um, I've got some extra bubbles in there I'm going to get rid of to get that dodecahedral bubble in the middle. And now I'm going to pop three pairs of films. Uh, two on the left and right, two top and bottom, and two front and back. And that leaves me with this cube-shaped bubble in the middle. And that cube has kind of strange faces to it there, kind of hourglass shapes. So that's kind of fun. If you distort the dodecahedral frame, crump it up, it turns out, and double dip it, we still get a nearly perfect dodecahedral bubble. It does not seem to impact it, kind of like the cube didn't. I'm sure unless it gets and starts to uh, infringe on that center space. So that's kind of neat to see as well. It's maybe distorting some of those pentagons a bit, but it's still not nearly as distorted as the outer frame is. We are now going to take and add a little CO2 to this. I'll bring it down there and help illustrate that dodecahedron trapped in the middle. Pop a couple of the surfaces there to make it a little bit easier to see. So that's kind of cool. And that is shrinking a bit. I tried to do it again, but I got bubbles on there. So it's kind of fun that I get these little bubbles for a while. They stayed suspended in there until they finally joined it. Then I finally get just a stream of CO2. Meanwhile, all those bubbles are shrinking um, on the perimeter there. So that's kind of fun. So I certainly didn't invent a, an octahedral soap film. Um, and I, I have to say, I saw it first by this amazing uh, man, Tom Noddy. I call him Bubble Master Extraordinaire, who's been doing this uh, for decades. He doesn't need a frame. He can just do it with uh, his little bubble wands and straws that he can produce such reproducible bubbles um, is amazing. So there he's got the outer workings of it. He starts to blow the inner one, and then he switches to a smoke fill. This is not CO2. That's a kind of a, just a, a fog. And gorgeous dodecahedral frame, a dodecahedral bubble uh, trapped among all those bubbles. So that's kind of fun. How about an icosahedron? Well, <laughs> the icosahedron, when you dip it in, there it is. Yeah, that's, it just gives you a mess. And it also tends to just spread out and form a bunch of triangular faces with a little hole on top right there. So that is the best way of covering it. Um, you really double dipping it. Do you get anything in there? Not so much. You end up with uh, <laughs> pretty much of a mess. I've yet to get anything recognizable by dipping an icosahedral frame into soapy water. So, a couple more things I'm gonna show you. Um, I don't wanna end on such a downer that the icosahedron didn't give us much. So, these are some other things. They're not platonic solids, but they certainly are fun all the same. 
That is cut from a soda bottle, and I've cut the top to make it a little bit smaller than the bottom so it fits inside there. Fill in the little bottom piece with soapy water. See how the top fits in there? And now as I lift these two apart, you would think maybe it would form a cylinder because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and that would be as much as straight lines, but instead it forms this, okay? Again, a surface with negative curvature. I, for a long time, thought that was a hyperboloid, but a hyperboloid is not a minimal surface structure. A catenoid is, so that is a catenoid. And there it is being pulled to its brink. And now watch the film at the very top race up into the bottle to get as small as possible. So that's kind of fun. Here is a helix with a rod down the middle and I dip in and get this wonderful, uh, that is certainly a helicoidal membrane, but that string there is going to let me do this. I popped half of it, and now I'm going to take that little tiny film there and stretch it around to cover, <laughs> to regenerate. So it's like zipping and unzipping that film. Um, all the while, the film is being as small as possible. So that's fun. And a slinky. So, check this out. I'm going to pop down below and you just saw, here I'll put it in slow motion, but you saw it even in full, at full speed, a soap film popping. You don't often get to see that, but this is going a rather long path up that. So that's neat. Another thing you do is to slow that down is to introduce a bubble and now when I pop below that now, <laughs> you can definitely see that soap film retreating. There's in slow motion. And it's neat because it has the uh, stored potential energy to drag that bubble uphill. Well, that's the presentation. I'm hoping you enjoyed it. Uh, check out the various links I have on my YouTube channel.